Let's pray. Creator God, you have implanted your law in our hearts. You have made us in your image and likeness. Help us to shine forth in our world with your presence, for we are your temples. We ask this in Jesus' name. He is the one who shows us the way. He is Lord with you forever and ever. Amen. Rabbi Harold Kushner, the author of uh, many wonderful books, including Why Bad Things Happen to Good People, told a story at a conference he was speaking at. And it's a, it's a parable, really, about an eight-year-old boy named Timmy. And Timmy was a good kid. He was an obedient child. His <clears throat> mother uh, always expected him to obey, and he always did. So he, she began to give him progressive levels of independence. And one day he asked to go to his friend's house because his friend had a new bicycle and they wanted to ride bikes together. So off Timmy went, but his mother said, be home at six. Well, six o'clock that evening came and went, and 6.15 and 6.30. And, and as Timmy became later and later, his mother began to worry more and more. And, and, and finally, when he walked into the house and half an hour, or 45 minutes late, his mother was really steamed. And he said, she said, Timmy, where were you? I was really worried about you. And Timmy said, well, my friend, he had an accident on his bicycle and I had to stay with him to help him. That didn't satisfy his mother. She said, Timmy, you should have been home when I told you to be home. What could you do to help fix your friend's bicycle? Jesus is not fixing bicycles in the gospel story today, but he can tell us something about Timmy's dilemma. We find the story situated in the, the story is told in all four gospels, but this in the gospel of John is placed right in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, right after his multiplication of wine at the wedding feast of Cana. And we're told at the end of that Cana story, that, that this was the first of his signs. So the Gospel of John is full of signs. What are the signs for? The signs are there to, to help us understand who Jesus is. And in, in that first sign in Cana, we're told at the, at the end of the story, this was done and, and, to, to, and the disciples saw Jesus' glory. And they came to believe. So, so let's just think of that from what is the glory that they saw in Jesus creating vats of really good wine? Well, one of the things is the glory of God is, is the fully alive person. And what Jesus shows, begins to show his disciples at Cana is his love of life and his compassion for all living beings and for all people, especially those who are most in need of his help. At Cana, there was a wedding and the wedding was a big thing in the village and it was embarrassing for the couple who were hosting the wedding feast to run out of wine. These feasts could last for a week or more. And Jesus' mother says, well, help them. They've run out of wine. And, and Jesus, while his hour, he says to her, has not yet come, he takes water and makes it into the finest wine, showing his disciples that he is different, that he is a person who is fully alive. St. Irenaeus in the second Christian century said that the glory of God is man fully alive. And Jesus shows us what that fullness of life looks like. And he invites us to follow him on the path to fully vibrant human life. Now, the very next story is the one that we just read today, the story about Jesus going to the temple and finding it a hot mess. So he goes to the temple, he's in the court of the Gentiles, and there are pigs, no, there aren't, pardon me, there are no pigs. There are, there are sheep and, and, and goats and, 
and doves and all the animals that are used for sacrifice. Now, the temple is a place where sacrifice happens. They need the animals there. They need the exchange tables there where, where the Roman money is exchanged for temple money because they didn't want the picture of the emperor in the temple. It was too idolatrous because it was a graven image of someone who claimed to be the son of God. So, so the commerce around the temple had been there for a long time, but the current temple administration, Caius, uh, Caiaphas and Annas, had brought all of that exchange into the court of the Gentiles. So a place that should have been quiet, should have been, should have been a, a place where people could prepare their hearts to be in the presence of God, had become a place that smelled like animals, that had the clatter of commerce. And, and what had happened in the temple was that they ex had exchanged community for commercial success. And Jesus looks at it, he says, get it out of here. <clears throat> he makes his whip, he drives out the animals. Can you imagine the chaos of this? Drives the animals out of the temple, flips the, 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 uh, the money changers' tables over, the coins are going all over the place. The doves, he says, get the darn things out of here because this is not a marketplace. This is my father's house. And at that point, the disciples recall the, the, the passage in the Old Testament, zeal for his father's house would consume him. But his, his commercially astute opponents go to him and said, who the heck are you? Who are you? You're not even a, a temple official. You come in here and create this havoc this, this, that's sanctioned by the high priest? What sign can you give us that you have this authority? So Jesus isn't going to give them a sign. He's going to tell them what to look for. He says, tear down this temple and I'll build it back up in three days. Now they're thinking about the temple that they're standing in that's, that's still under construction after 46 years. And they're, they're saying to themselves and to him, are you out of your mind? This, how can you do that? How can you, one person, build up the temple? But he was thinking of the temple of his body. And that, I think, is where we learn the most from this passage. Because in Jesus, the presence of God resides not in a building, it resides in a person. And in the person of Christ, we find the presence of God fully and uniquely present in his world. And what does Jesus tell us? By embodying the divinity within his human flesh, he says to us, you can do this too. He says to us that the potential for our humanity, your humanity and my humanity, is to be the vessel for God. And what we have to realize is that every human being has that potential. The word in Hebrew for face, I believe it's panim, is interesting because it's a plural noun. There, there isn't a sense of face. The, the, the word implies faces. We can't know who we are. We can't know our own face unless we see it reflected in the face of the other. And ultimately the other is God. We can't know who we are unless we know who God is. And as we see the face of God, we can't think that we know God in himself when we can't see his face in the face of our brother's and sisters. And so Jesus is inviting us in this passage to realize that where we find the presence of God today is not in buildings. It's in, it's in relationships. We see the face of God in the face of our neighbors. We see the face of God in the face of our beloved. 
We see the face of God in the face of strangers. And we see the face of God in the face of our enemies. And we are invited to love God wherever his image is found. And so, can we enjoy a meal knowing that our neighbors are hungry? In some religious families of faith, there's a portion of, of food brought into the family that's set aside for those in need. This church houses a food pantry where we store food to be given to our, our hungry neighbors. But isn't that what we have to do? Because we can't ignore the hunger of God as it cries out to us in, in the hearts and lives of those who have less than we have. We've been given tremendous abundance, most of us. But those who have been given abundance are challenged to give abundantly. This passage, this brief passage of the Gospel of John asks us to find and respond to the face of God wherever we find it. In our friends, certainly. In our families, of course. But also in strangers and even in our enemies. We live in a world right now filled with hatred and mistrust and anger. And we can't play that game. We can't fall into the ways of the world that would allow us to despise people simply because of what they believe. Whether we disagree with their religious beliefs or their political beliefs, it does not matter. We must love them all. And as we do that, we will discover that the people we disagree with, we can actually learn something from them if we only start to listen to them. You see, you can't learn anything when you don't think you have anything to learn. And you can't learn anything from a person you're screaming at. But we can learn a lot from people who have different points of view from our own. But we have to be open to who they are. And we have to give a place to them in our hearts and in our lives. And that means let's think about who it is that we are intolerant of because they are precisely the ones we have to think about, pray for, and be open to. Maybe they can teach us something that we don't know. Timmy taught his mother something she didn't know. She's sitting there in the kitchen fuming because he's a half an hour, 45 minutes late for his curfew. And his excuse was, I had to help, help my friend whose bike was broken. And she said to him, how can you help him fix his bike? You don't know anything about fixing bikes. And Timmy answered him, her, by saying, Mom, I had to stay and help him cry. We can be present lovingly to those who, whose hearts are broken. And we don't have to have answers. We often will not have answers. But by just being with them to help them cry, we will have given them something of the presence of God that is in our hearts. And that's what Jesus asks us to do in this passage from the gospel. May the Lord give each one of us the wisdom of little Timmy, the wisdom to be present to our neighbors when they need us most. Amen.